This is again the right sided hip bone, this time being captured from posterior and lateral direction. Only from that direction one can fully illustrate the entire iliac part of the hip bone. As one can see, it really is flat, broadened part of the bone, which is described in the following form. Generally speaking, the whole structure that you can see right now on the screen is known as the ala of the hip bone. Ala in Latin terms means the wing of the hip bone. Although it is quite rounded, anatomists have managed to found four different corners that could be identified on ala. There are two located on the front and their names are the anterior superior iliac spine and anterior inferior iliac spine. If we go all the way to the back, we're going to see also additional two spines, the posterior superior iliac spine and the posterior inferior iliac spine. So in other words, as the bone is described as having four corners, one can understand that it has somewhat of a quadrangular shape. The uppermost margin of the bone, which connects anterior superior iliac spine and goes all the way to the back, to the posterior superior iliac spine, is known as the iliac crest. It does make sense to see the iliac crest from a right hand bone from the above. So one can see it's not perfect straight line, but rather looks like a very elongated letter S. On the iliac crest, which is fair to say palpable detail of the bone as it is situated within the flank, one can identify wide area that is serving point for attachment for the abdominal muscles, transversus abdominis, internal oblique abdominal muscle, and external oblique abdominal muscle. These three muscles will have more than enough space to attach on the top part of the hip bone, sharing the crest of the ilium. On the outside of the ilium, which is also quite broad and really a very generous area, there is plenty of space for attachment of muscles, however, only three of them will have the privilege to be attached on the external outer surface of the iliac ala. There are three gluteal muscles, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, and gluteus maximus. There are lines of division showing very clearly fields that will be used for attachment of these three gluteal muscles and perhaps on this bone, one which is most obvious and easiest to identify is the bony ridge which is just above my thumb here and that is known as the posterior gluteal line. Area which is further posterior to the posterior gluteal line, so this space here, is used for the attachment of gluteus maximus muscle. But don't worry, gluteus maximus will not rely only on this little part of the hip bone. There will be also posterior aspect of sacrum and local ligaments that will enable the largest of the gluteal muscles to have a proper attachment. Also on the ala, and sometimes it is worth to take a look and to try to ask for a little help by refraction of light, to identify another bony ridge which exists across the ala and that was is known as the anterior gluteal line. Let me rest the camera first and then to point out what is the anterior gluteal line. It is this bony ridge here. A space which is marked between anterior and the posterior gluteal lines is used as the attachment for gluteus medius muscle. Finally, just above the acetabulum, there is a third bony ridge, barely visible here, and that one is known as the inferior gluteal line. Third and last gluteal muscle that will be attached between inferior gluteal line here and the anterior gluteal line here is the smallest of the three, but it will occupy what looks like the greatest available surface area, that is the gluteus minimus muscle.
Please note that three gluteal muscles are really having a very neat and very logical arrangement above the acetabulum. Now, as we know that the attachment of gluteus minimus is just above and slightly anterior to the acetabulum, it is easy to accept the idea that gluteus minimus is a muscle which will assist in hip flexion and also will be able to produce a bit of internal or medial rotation. Muscle which comes next to it being attached between anterior and the posterior gluteal lines, the gluteus medius, is a muscle which clearly has more posterior position relative to acetabulum and for that reason gluteus medius is going to be much more involved in hip abduction and to some extent it will be able to also extend and slightly rotate but in a lateral direction. Finally, the muscle which is largest of the three and having just this little area on the back side of the ilium, gluteus maximus, is the muscle which will be considered the strongest and clearly will have the best position to be able to extend the hip joint. Although we extend the hip joint many times during any given day, force of gluteus maximus will be required only when we want to have offset the gravitational force such as when climbing stairs. While walking or running, contractile force of gluteus maximus is not necessarily used because extension of the hip joint primarily relies on the posterior thigh or hamstring muscles. Now after we have seen the outer surface of Ala, let me slowly rotate the bone and we will take a closer look on the inner aspect of the bone. It looks quite different and it is quite obvious also that we have two distinctly different areas on the inside of the ala on its internal aspect. Part which is anteriorly and occupies perhaps about two-thirds is what is called the iliac fossa and then on the posterior part we're going to find some landmarks that are important and interesting for proper joint that will form between ilium part of the hip bone and the sacrum. We have already encountered four different landmarks that will mark the ala, the anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine and on the posterior aspect the posterior superior iliac spine posterior inferior iliac spine iliac crest which runs between posterior and anterior superior iliac crests is the palpable part that we have within our flank so the smooth part which is anterior two-thirds obviously covering most of the ala is called the iliac fossa. Fossa because it is slightly indented area and in a living person will be entirely occupied by the muscle which is known as the iliacus. Iliacus will join and merge its fibers with saws major forming what is called the iliosaws muscle that will take the responsibility of main and major flexor of the hip. Although this is part of the hip bone please do not consider that the iliac fossa is part of the true pelvis. True pelvis starts inferior to this sharp bony ridge known as the arcuate line. So in real world we can say that true pelvis is only marked between pubic and ischial parts of left and right side of the hip bone and the sacrum. Above the arcuate line although it is part of the hip bone or pelvic bone, we have the lower abdominal compartment. At the posterior part of the ala of ilium, we will see the auricular surface, which is articular surface that makes the contact with the sacrum. And on the sacrum, you probably will remember there is the same name, articular surface, called the auricular surface of the sacrum. Further, superiorly and more posteriorly to the auricular surface, we're finding area of pretty much intense roughness and ruggedness of the bone, which is known as the iliac tuberosity.
Once again, in a cross-reference to anatomy of the sacrum, next to the sacral, auricular surface, we also had the sacral tuberosity. So tuberosity of the hip bone will be facing into tuberosity of the sacrum, and between these two bones, practically very strong ligaments will be attached to either of the two tuberosities. We mentioned earlier as one of the landmarks that there is an arcuate line that is also seen on the inner aspect of the hip bone. It is one of the multiple landmarks which separates a true pelvis, which is inferior, this obliquely running line, versus false pelvis or superior pelvis, which is practically nothing else other than the lowest part of the abdominal cavity. The arcuate line, if you follow it, we will stop practically at this location here, which is known as the iliopubic eminence. Iliopubic eminence is a reflection of the acetabulum where my finger is right now, and the greatest compressive forces between the head of the femur and the acetabulum while we maintain the upright position essentially develops in this area. So that's why iliopubic eminence, which is quite large, essentially is a reflection of our upright position.